All right, a lot is said about Tom Cruise, but one thing is for sure, this man has range. He could woo you. You complete me. He can provoke you. It is a game, guys. You want to think it's not, huh? You want to think it's not, you go back to the schoolyard. You have that crush on big-titted Mary Jane. That's an awesome scene for Magnolia. He can also break you. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! But any way you look at it, Tom is one of the biggest box office stars of all time. Let's go back to the beginning. Tom was born in Syracuse, New York, home of the Orange Men. Uh, spent many of his early years on the move, including a few years in Ottawa, where legend has it, he started to perform. But when he was 12 years old, a big thing happened in his life. Tom's parents split up, and he ended up living with his moms in New Jersey, where, in high school, he starred in a production of Guys and Dolls, and my man got the acting bug. But like a lot of aspiring actors, you really can't do it in the town you're from unless you're from New York City, which is where Tom ended up when he went to audition after audition. And then 1981, it really started to click. He made his on-screen debut in the movie Endless Love. Two years later, his first starring role. No one forgets risky business. Some of the girls are wearing my mother's clothing. And that was clearly just the beginning because we all know Tom went on to be in some of the biggest films of the 80s. Top Gun, alongside Paul Newman in The Color of Money, with Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man, and Oliver Stones, born on the 4th of July. They say it is a sin if you play with your penis. I just wish I could. Don't say penis in this house! Oh penis! No! Penis, big f***ing erect penis, no! Mom! That's the role, by the way, that got Tom his first of three Oscar nominations. Now, something else happened in the late 80s. Tom married an actress by the name of Mimi Rogers, and like a lot of marriages, that one did not go the distance, but there was an impact, because Mimi is believed to be the person that introduced Tom to Scientology, which we all know now is a major part of his life. But the side we always see is the movie side. Let's go back there. By the time the 90s rolled around, Tom was kind of a blockbuster star, uh, and he continued his run of hits. A Few Good Men, Jerry Maguire, Eyes Wide Shut, starring Tom and his then-wife Nicole Kidman, whom we met on a previous set. Since then, Tom's released a movie a year, and the one thing he is not is typecast. He was a bit of a mind bender in Vanilla Sky. Slightly pathological in Collateral, and uh, well, he was, you know, kind of creepy slash amazing in Tropic Thunder. I know you want the goodies. Now we all know when you're that big a star, you get a lot of publicity, a lot of drama, a lot of paparazzi. Uh, Tom has been questioned repeatedly about his faith, his marriage to Katie Holmes, and of course, we've all seen a couple of high-profile moments on TV. Hello, Oprah. Along the way, you may have heard, and I don't know how you wouldn't have, but Tom and Katie had a baby girl. Her name is Suri. Uh, Tom also has two kids from his marriage to Nicole. But despite all the attention on his personal life, anybody who knows Tom will tell you he is zeroed in on his career. And his latest film is a big role. It tells the story of a group of high-ranking German officers who came up with a plot to kill Hitler and gain control of the military. The code name for the operation is the same name of the movie, Valkyrie. Close the door. Be seated. Do you know how this war will end, Lieutenant? The portrait will be unhung, and the man will be hung. I'm engaged in high treason with all means available to me. Can I count you in? Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Cruise. They know you. It's very nice. True or false, did you choose that role because you got to wear an eye patch? Uh, true. <laughs> uh, for a lot of people who don't know that story. I couldn't wait to say that line, by the way. That one engaged in high treason with all means available to me. I love that line. I wonder if when you read a script, do you look at a script and think, regardless of the quality of the rest of the script, you see that one line and go, there's something there. I can oh, yeah. do that. There's movies where you read lines like that and go, oh, I can't wait to, I, I want to say that line. 
You know, I remember in uh, Jerry Maguire, uh, You Complete Me, that whole kind of stuff. I thought, oh, that's, that's beautiful. You know, his dialogue, there's certain moments. You know, but do you know... Help me help you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the, the, the Magnolia character, uh, that whole we character... We can't say on camera. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of people don't know in the Valkyrie story that there were many attempts at the life of Hitler mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah, this, what they, I think they, when I read the script, I, I thought this is, uh, I, just as a pure movie cinema experience, it was this, this conspiracy thriller suspense. Because when I first heard about the story, I said, okay. I, but when I picked it up, I couldn't stop turning the pages. And then to know that these actual events happened and the point that it's uh, the level of courage and here, I found it very inspiring and also gripping. It's interesting, you know, because Spike Lee tried it with Miracle Saint Anna. There's this, the idea that the German army, the Nazi soldiers aren't one amorphous army, that within each army were these stories. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, 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 that, if that played a role for you. You looked at this and went, this is really the ultimate underdog. Yeah, I felt it was, the, you know, for a movie, I felt it was the uh, ultimate underdog. I thought it was... I, I want to entertain an audience. I, you know, the films that I've chosen have been varied, but my interest is entertaining an audience. Like when I see a movie, I want to be entertained, and this is just great drama, great suspense, and that's what I felt about it. I wonder watching it. And I hadn't heard this story before. I thought, is this true? And with the amount of research that uh, Chris McCory had done, and to find out that, oh my gosh, actually, Stauffenberg existed and these things, all the things that are written in there are from the resistance and things that he had personally said that's very well documented. Well, his wife only died a couple of years ago, right? I know, I know, I know, I know. Is it different playing a character where you know that there's a family? Yeah, and I think that played a, you know, that played a very strong part, even though this, the structure of the film is very much that, you know, thriller structure yeah. and suspense structure, but there's, there's moments where I thought of him as, as a man going through this, someone who realized that the only way to stop him is from within, that it's not, it's not enough to just kill Hitler. Because it, growing up, I always thought, why doesn't someone just pop a cap in, mm -hmm. in Hitler, you know? Because 50 Cent wasn't <laughs> you know? around back then. That's 50 why. Cent wasn't around, but I thought about that, you know? I, I wondered, when watching that back, could you have been in that movie if you played the Nazi soldier who didn't have the redeeming could you have played the other side? What do you mean? You know, like, you know, because that character is an interesting character because you have a journey with them. Mm -hmm. But to play the other side, the guys that didn't want to stop the assassination, could you have played a role like that? I mean, I could have, but that doesn't interest me. No, no not, not, not in that subject matter. That, I wouldn't have done that. Uh, I don't know. I just, you know, for me, it's... Uh, I, obviously, I, I grew up, it's, it's so tragic. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't... I wouldn't be interested in telling that story. <laughs> that story was already told for real, and I, I think that we, what, what interests me about this is that our perception of what these people were like and what a German officer was, to see it, it's new from the inside to see that, oh my gosh, there were people who could actually think for themselves, mm -hmm. who disagreed with Hitler, uh, and when, you know, the film doesn't put this in, but as early as 1938, where you know, Stauffenberg was saying, someone has got to shoot this guy, mm -hmm. and this, this is not okay. And uh, I found that very compelling. You talk about a, movie. a lot of varied movie roles you had, um, and within each character, there's a lot of range. We'll come back and we'll talk more with Tom Cruise, and we'll talk about some of the choices he's made and some of the films he's been in. More with Tom Cruise when the hour returns. <laughs> Also coming up, is Tom Cruise a stalker? We drove to Hoffman's house outside. You know, at least what we thought was Dustin Hoffman's house. <laughs> How does he deal with failure? And what the hell was he thinking in Tropic Thunder? I want to have fat hands. <laughs> and I said, and I want to dance. <laughs> More with Tom Cruise when the hour returns. Tom Cruise on the hour. You, how 
curious, you know, doing press for this film in North America versus going to Europe and doing this, where, as Henry Rollins once said, World War II is still an ouch. Like, it's still a big deal. Yeah, I was, you know, growing up in America and living here, I lived in Canada for a while, you have a whole different, yeah. There's <laughs> one girl from Ottawa, Ottawa in the back. Right Ottawa there. Here, <laughs> there from Ottawa. No, no one's from Ottawa here. Uh, we actually have a policy. Is you? Yeah, policy? We have no a policy. <laughs> <laughs> we figured one or okay, two Ottawa right, people. I didn't that's know it. that. Mm-hmm. How old were you in Ottawa? Like 9, 10, 11, that era? Yeah. yeah. Where, yeah. Me now? No, when you were in Ottawa. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's 9, 10, 11. I mean, yeah. What are you, 21 now? Yeah, 22. 20, no. <laughs> How old was I? I was about uh, eight, nine, yeah. ten years old. Those are formative years in a young man's life. Years. Formative years. I heard that you, uh, your mom didn't want you to be a hockey player, but you... Yeah, she said, you're going to knock your teeth out doing that. <laughs> and I actually, anyway. she, I had figure skates, and when you moved to, I moved to, uh, in, it was like, no one would talk to you if you didn't know how to skate. So <laughs> I would go to the ice skating rink late at night and skate until I learned. I said, look, I can skate now. Please get me a pair of hockey skates. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of being tortured at school for my figure skates. <laughs> All right, Valkyrie in Europe. Uh, yeah. what, what, did you screen this for a German audience? No, we screened it uh, for American audiences, for German audiences, and it's uh, very powerful uh, screening it for an audience. Uh, you know, it, to see, you know, you don't know how a film's going to translate for any audience. You know, when you're making it, because we're, I want to entertain people, it's like watching an audience, and they're similar in that they don't move. You know, they, you know that your tension and your story and the humor is working. And for a German audience, uh, it's very moving. It obviously has a whole different uh, meaning for them. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud. I'm very proud of the film and very proud of what we all did. How do you quantify a movie as a success? How do you decide if this film's a success or not? And is it different from how it was? Well, I think you always want the movie to make its money back. And then some, there's that financial aspect. And then there's the artistic success of did we accomplish? Are we communicating what we think we're communicating to an audience? And, and also then there's the years later, are people still talking about it? They, do they still think about that film? Is it still a relevant film? Because I, you know, that's, that's how you can judge it. I think you're going to get that for years and years for your performance in Tropic Thunder. <laughs> 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 that was one of those moments where it's like, oh my God, <laughs> Tom Cruise is dancing and he's yeah, into it. I want to try to give a few oh my gods to some audiences. <laughs> no, how, how did that come, that, that film? Because you're your leading man, you don't have to do those kinds of films, but I suppose you just wanted that. Yeah, look. I like all different kinds of movies. I was working on the film with, with Ben and, uh, you know, I work with friends on different films and we were talking about it and I said, well, where's the studio? You know, you need a studio for the structure. And he said, we started working and he came back and he wrote this character. And uh, we were just, because he's a buddy of mine, we were hanging out. I said, okay, no, I want to play this character. And I said, I want to have fat hands. <laughs> and I said, and I want to dance. <laughs> and he looked at me a moment, he says, fat hands and dance. He said, oh, okay, okay. So, so then as, as we were developing uh, the character in the makeup test, I just started dancing just to give him an idea of the kind of dancing that I wanted to do. <laughs> And there wasn't music to it, and then he edited it together, and he, I, he said, this is, this, is, this is hilarious. And he found that piece of music, and he cut it together, and uh, so I just started working on the dancing. Taps, Sean Penn, you go to Los Angeles, Sean Penn, a young Sean Penn, picks you up at the airport? Yeah. What, you're for Tom Cruise. He says, you got to come out to L.A., we just finished it, and uh, Penn said, you got to come, so he picked me up after we finished shooting Taps. You were young, too. I was 18 years old. I was 18. And... Uh, he got in the car and we drove around. We drove to Hoffman's house outside. Or, you know, at least what we thought was Dustin Hoffman's house. <laughs> Jack Nicholson. And uh, we, we sat outside those houses thinking, you know, talking about what do you think these guys are doing now? Brando's house, we went to that too. And just spent the night sitting outside like, you know, what do you think they're doing? You know, kind of thinking about it. Today that's called stocking I don't know, man. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. So every now and then when you... Where you go? Should we knock on the door? No, no, we can't knock on the door. Do you ever look out your window now and see somebody parked out in front and goes, ah, oh, that's just the next Tom Cruise sitting there? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> but then Hoffman and Nicholson, I mean, all of a sudden you're in, you know, you got Rain Man with Hoffman, Few Good Men with Nicholson. I know. I know. Life's a funny thing. It is a funny thing. And I told, I told them the stories. It took me a while to hang out with them to know, to make sure that they knew, you know. And then one day Nicholson opened up and was telling me stories about uh, Chinatown. 
incredible stories. And I said, well, I got a story for you. <laughs> Maybe not quite as good as your Chinatown stories, but, uh, and then uh, with Dustin. And Dustin, of course, said, you should have knocked on the door. You should have knocked on the door. He would have, had, you know, Dustin would have had us in there. And, uh, you still, did you do your Jack Nicholson in front of Jack Nicholson? Uh, your impersonation, which is pretty bang on. Yeah, yeah, I did actually. The side, he goes, not bad, not bad. <laughs> Those guys, because there's no training to be a movie star. There's, there's training, in a sense, to be an artist in terms of getting you into the door. But yeah. what you do with it, how you evolve, how you grow as a man in that, there's no real training unless you get a mentor who's got your Listen, best interest. I was interest. lucky because I, I didn't have training, really. I watched a lot of movies, and even then, you know, you didn't know how movies were made. But when I started working, when I did taps, and I didn't know whether that was ever going to be, if I was ever going to work again, I just, but I love movies so much. It was, I'd be in the camera truck, I'd be in the wardrobe, uh, in props, and, uh, you know, to be able to hang out and hear from Tim Hutton and Sean Penn, guys who had grown up uh, in acting and having parents that were actors. Oh, they had Falcon and the Snowman, which was incredible. Yeah, they, and they did Falcon and the Snowman, unbelievable. He's, um, you know, very talented, extremely talented. And uh, so to have that, I felt very fortunate. And then to work with Dustin Hoffman and, uh, and Paul Newman and Hackman, Duvall, these guys that, you know, towering legends that uh, you just sit there, pay attention, learn. And I thought about you when Paul Newman. Hopefully, learned something. I thought about you when, when Paul Newman passed because he played a huge role in your life, yeah. and and I don't know how you know how I mean, with the color money obviously there was a lot of it. I don't know at the end you know if you guys still had a, had a, the kind of relationship, but I wondered. Yeah, as, they always have that that rapport, even though our lives you know you get busy, sure. but it was always uh, what did that he mean feeling. To you? Well, I think you know when you talk about people who right then when I did Color of Money, Top Gun, and Color of Money to have that guy who had been there, done that, been through the fires and, uh, and had the victories to, he's just a guy that I always admired. Uh, I think that he's, I think the way that he lived his life and how he cared about people and was very generous in that way as an artist. And he's someone who constantly pushed himself uh, as an artist and, and also was a family man and was married and children. and. It meant a lot to me. Not, not that he, he would sit down and, and mentor, but he's just an example for life. But, and he also, you know, you, you knew you were doing well. I remember after, I think it was, I don't know, after Rain Man or Born on the Fourth of July, you know, to get that call and, you know, we'd hang out or something. He goes, well, you know, you're doing good, kid, you know, to get that kind of Validation. support. And, and just, you know, he's just, he was just a very special... Uh, artist and a very special man, and I, I, I hear his voice sometimes in my head as you know when things are happening, and he's a good guy. At what point did you realize that you were being taken seriously as an actor? Because you know a lot. I mean, when when you came on the scene, they were like, "Oh, pretty Tom Cruise is," and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then you run around in your underwear and all that, right? Yeah. But 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 it's it's hard for people to make that transition from being. I was happy to be running around. <laughs> <my underwear. laughs> Is that what you, uh, you do that at home? Like, I was like, well, I don't care what people are saying. I'm making movies. I'm really happy to make movies. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't you? Actually, I have done that at home. It just when I, you know, when I was a kid. To that song? Yeah, it hasn't. Well, I don't know whether it's that song. But don't people do that? Music, yeah. singing, you know, we all do that. Every damn we night. We all do that, man. Every damn I know. night. <laughs> what, how do you know? Are you watching me? No. <laughs> um, but at what point did you, tr did you get a sense that, you know what, I think people are starting to get that I'm an actor now, that, that it is more than just that? I, I never really, I tried not to think about things like that. I was looking at, okay, just, I'm, they're going to let me make another movie. I'm get, I get another opportunity. And for me, it was always just learn my craft. Mm -hmm. Learn my craft, uh, be appreciative for the opportunities that I have, and just keep going. I get to make the movie. And... You know, when I'm making a film, it's 24-7, uh, and I want it to be everything it is. So that, that's kind of how I've, and everything else that people say or what happens, and it's, and it's really nice, and it's not things that I ignore, but it's, you can't have that be the driving force. Otherwise, it's just... Uh, can unravel you. Yeah, I mean, for me, there's times where I felt for myself certain points of even just acting in risky business, a starring role. I was very young and I thought, okay, 
this could be it. And then, you know, you think, okay, you know, the next film and the next film and certain moments where when I heard Dustin Hoffman wanted to work with me, or I remember meeting Steven Spielberg after he had done E.T. and he said, you know, you and I should make a film together. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, you know. <laughs> and uh, really? Uh, okay. And then, and then with Hoffman uh, and Born the Fourth of July, those years for me and, and Newman uh, and Color of Money, thinking, okay, how, can I do it? Can I do it? Can I do it? And, and really just, just focusing on learning, always, uh, for me. Story, understanding cinematic storytelling. We're going to talk about some of those early roles and see what Tom thought the first time he saw himself on TV in like Endless oh, Love God. or something. Or Tom Cruise, <laughs> we come back. Thanks.